it was more as a friendship thing. We didn't see ourselves as a gang, but obviously other people did. We started getting recognised as a gang when we did music. So I used to be in a, a music crew. We used to call it crew, but obviously these call it gangs. We used to rep our area, which was in Coventry, which was Potter's Green. And we had a lot of conflicts with other areas. I think my friendship group were a group where we all had a part to play. So me personally, I was an observer, I was a watcher, I would watch everything that happened. So anyone that looked odd, that came around the area, I would spot very quickly. I was also a person that I'm very loyal. So if someone got hurt, I would join in and I wouldn't run off. Even if I was scared, I wouldn't run off. And I was a person that was, I would put a foot in, but I know when to put my foot out. And some of my friends weren't that kind of people. I started growing me mentally and educationally in myself that you can't be around the same circle and try and think different. You have to be around people that think different. So it challenges what you were used to. Hi, my name's Andrew Payne, host of the podcast Men On Show. And I'm so excited uh, this week to have Anton Noble on the show, uh, founder of the organization uh, Guiding Young Minds. He's a specialist working in gang culture and youth violence with his own lived experience himself. Uh, he has five years working as an outreach advisor, qualified youth mentor. He's a speaker advisor, uh, recognized as one of the UK's leading mentors within the field of, of gang prevention and gang culture. He featured in the Channel 4 documentary, Britain's Young Drug Runners, which won a Best Documentary Award in 2019. And crucially, overall... He supported the Hollyoaks team in a county line story. And listen, if you're working, getting drawn into soap operas to help with the development of their stories because of your expertise, that is a absolute quality stamp. Uh, Anton, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Andrew. Cool. So just tell me about yourself um, growing up, Anton, uh, as a boy, as, as a young man. What was life like for you? So I... I grew up in a, a two-parent household. Uh, my family are Jamaican heritage. Um, I have an older brother, a younger brother, and a younger sister. Uh, we got brought up in a Christian family, so it was very, uh, very cultural. Uh, however, a lot of things that in our household that I believe was, was normal wasn't normal. And uh, my parents obviously had a, a horrific uh, upbringing where my mum did. And some things that happened in her life came to us, which my older brother and myself then started uh, eventualising because we didn't, we didn't get validation or love at home. So we seek validation and love elsewhere, which led us in situations what we've we've had comebacks and challenges in life and when you say things you grew up obviously for, for most kids what we experience at home is our normal but you realize now that they weren't normal what kind of specific things is there anything specific or tangible that you can recall uh, just uh lack of lack of love no attention uh not coming to our our games or achievements that we did, praising us, uh, just doing things to make them happy, never really supporting us in our school education, yeah, that kind of thing. And they have spending more time at work than with their kids, all that kind right. of stuff. So they they were very driven, would you say, as parents from your experience? Uh, I've, sometimes I feel whatever was happening at home between my parents, they they went out to work for a distraction and right. they entertained other other children and other kids. Obviously, my mum was a specialist carer and my dad was an engineer. So my dad uh, did a lot of work. My dad's a, a good person. My mum's a good person, but they 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 both had their issues in the marriage, right. which, which led in divorce. And that's where things started spiraling. 
how did divorce so if that's where it, it began how did that divorce well, how old were you when, when that happened and how did that I impact was you 11 years old. right that's the same age as my uh, eldest boy now and, and how did that divorce impact you It impacts me a lot because uh, I got brought up in a Christian way where when you get married, you get married once and you're married, you're married all the time. You, you stay faithful, you, you're committed. When things go wrong, you work it out. So that's all I knew. And then when they... divided and split up it, it impacted my emotions and I don't think they really spoke to us about it they just got on with it and I feel that they didn't care they didn't care about us they cared about what what they were going through and that's where I think me and my brother especially my older one got affected Yeah, yeah. And is that when it sort of started for you getting involved in gang culture or did that come later? Um, uh, that came, no, yeah, that came later. That came at a time when I was going through, so I was trying to find myself. And I started going around different kind of people who I liked. And I would go around good people, uh, people that were opportunities, people that were popular, hard. Uh, and I found, I found my place in people that were popular, had respect, bullied people. or just the people that everyone looks looks at and I hang I hanged around with older people I was the youngest Yeah, how old were you when at that time? so at that time I was 13 14 so most of my brother's friends I would hang around with and most of my friend the oldest friend that I had was 25 when I was 13 14. Right. And is that how you started to get involved in gang culture then? Yeah, I think it was more as a friendship thing. We didn't see ourselves as a gang, but obviously other people did. But we, we started getting recognised as a gang when we did music. So I used to be in a, a music crew and Okay. we used to call it crew, but obviously these call it gangs. But uh, yeah, we used to rep our area, which was which was in Coventry, which was Potter's Green. And we had a lot of conflicts with other areas. But back then we we could... still go to certain areas, but we'll get trouble from. And then it started increasing where we couldn't go to other areas in commentary, which we had to roll in a group. And that's where I feel this generation in commentary has got it from our generation, but they just stepped it up a level. And how would you say, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm interested in your experiences of, of, of gang culture or, or crew culture, but how have they stepped it up? How, how is it different today? I feel with us, we still have respect. Like if we we wouldn't go to your house, and we wouldn't go to like troubled mums or fathers or siblings if they're not involved. These kids will trouble anyone that's and who you're part of just to hurt you. So they'll they'll throw acid at your mum. They will they will smash up your dad's car. They will kick your little sister over off the bike. But we that to us that's morally wrong. We wouldn't do that. And these kids don't have the moral and values that we have. And that's the sad thing. Their conscience is, most of their conscience is dead. Okay, and I'll come back to that. I might actually make a note of that now. Um, I, I'm interested in that as to why. I want to explore that. So I'm just going to jot something down there from what you've said. Tell me, though, about your life in the gang. What was life like? Was it, um, was it violent? Was it scary, exciting? Was it all of those things? Tell me about life. I, my, uh, I think my friendship group were a group where we all had a part to play. So me, personally, I was an observer. I was a watcher. I would watch everything that happens. So anyone that looked odd, that came around the area, I would spot very quickly. Uh, I was also a person that I'm very loyal. So if someone got hurt, I would join in. And I wouldn't run off. Even if I was scared, I wouldn't run off. And... Uh, I was a person that was, I would put a foot in, but I know when to put my foot out. And some of my friends weren't that kind of people. 
there was friends that I knew if I was with one, I'm going to get in trouble. And there's friends that I was with that I knew that would stay out of trouble, but would stick up for themselves if they had to. That that those friends I would I would I would be around more when I want to be around different people. I wouldn't go with a friend that that just causes trouble. But he was still my friend, but I wouldn't go around him so much that I put myself in a situation where I don't want to be in a situation. And was there like a bit of an adrenaline rush, a sort of a thrill for being out there, being a watcher, being needed, being loyal? Presumably your your crew members were were loyal back. Was there was is there like a an adrenaline buzz where it's actually an enjoyable time in your life? Yeah, it's it. I feel that they they were my friends and when I when I needed help or speaking to, I could speak to them. Anything else going on, I could speak to them. But as I've grown up, there are certain things I didn't speak to them about. And I, I feel at that time, whatever I was going through, any trouble or uh, how my mental state was, they were the medicine at that point. But as I started yeah. healing myself, they started falling off. Okay, interesting. How, so at what point did you get to where you were like, I, I need to heal myself, I, I want to heal myself? And was that the point where you started to move away from, from, from your, your crew? I, I found myself changing. I found myself that I was trying to please people, but not myself. So I'll make my, I'll make my identity in a such a way that comes as people will be attracted to them and like instead of like doing something that I like to do and I felt that uh, my behaviour and how I presented myself started replicating what they would do and you can't I've, I started growing me mentally and educationally in myself that you can't be around the same circle and try and think different you have to be around people that think different. So it challenges what you were used to. to I love that. Let, let me just, that's so important that you can't be around the same circle of people and think different. I like that. You have to, as, as you evolve and mature, there will be some groups that you have to break free from in order to be the, the person you want to be. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and certain yeah. behaviours and habits. Yeah. And I wonder how many people in that crew sort of do want something different but can't see beyond the crew or they don't want to, they're afraid of change. And so they just get stuck. Not necessarily because they even want to consciously be there, but it's what they know. And as you said, unless you break free, do you, do you think most people like want to be part of it, are validated by it? Or do you think some people just get trapped in it and then they just don't see a way out? Yeah, there's there's people that are that are in it and they could come out of it whenever they want. It's that it's a, it's like a, it's more of a friendship. It's more of a yeah. thing where uh if something happens, someone gets hurt in your family or you need help with it, and then you've got the friends where they're just the tag alongs so and they're not really a part of the crew. They're just there to to make the numbers. They are the ones that it's hard for them to get out because they've never been a part of it. They're, and, they've, and they know too much, which makes them dangerous. So th th those kids that get part, involved with things like that, that's when they get, they get more of the drama than the one that's the core group of the gang. They, don't, they can come out whenever they want. They just, they just get told, if, if you're stepping out, you're stepping out fully. No half heartedness or working with someone someone else. It'd be like yeah. yeah. So there's always the opportunity within a gang to say, I'm gonna go and get a job. I'm going off the clock. This is kind of you're a great bunch of people. And, and the gang would accept that from from yeah. core members of the group. Yeah, it's not it's yeah. not like uh obviously there's a lot of culture coming down here in the UK now, so they're bringing their cultures, what they do in other areas and countries to here in the UK. But British ones, I know some very hefty gang members that work now and no one troubles them. 
and then I and then I see some ones that weren't rated still in it because they feel like they can't get out of it because they'll get bullied or they're scared because they did too much. Yeah. And it's all it's all a mental state. If you, you can't if you can't see yourself out first, you can't get out. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. So you have to actually have that vision of being outside. Is it I mean, by the time you made that decision mentally, had you had enough dealings with the police by then that make getting another job is actually quite difficult. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a criminal record with incidents that I've done. And uh, uh, to be fair, every job that I had, they, they all liked me. So a lot of times I, I knew the people or my parents knew the people and they gave, and they gave me a chance. So me personally, I never really had to uh, beg or... Or get rejection. Every every job that I've went for, I got. Yeah. And but there's other people that was in my situation didn't. And they had the challenges of rejection and going back to what they what they know where no one does reject them. And it, yeah. it's it's scary to step into a, a new a new a new world that you that you ain't done for years. Yeah. So do you would you say you know, for anybody that's thinking about, well, how do we help people? How do we prevent sort of gangs? And how do we bring people out of gangs, out of unhealthy friendship networks, however you would term it? Looking at your experience from what I've picked up so far, it was kind of like, it feels to me like a, a gradual maturity and, and, and just growing where in the end, you're sort of becoming a, a bit incompatible is that right? Have I understood that right? Or was there like a standout moment where you're like, enough? I I, I had moments where I was transitioning. And that's, that, that's the key, transition. And transition is where I'm finding out that I don't belong here, but it's hard for me to leave here. And, but the, the blessing was, a lot of times when I was out with my friends and I was in certain, certain places or situations, I always had someone stranger say to me, you don't belong with these all the time. And at the start, I used to ignore it. But when it happened constantly, I thought, nah, that's 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 yeah. some higher calling saying, I'm yeah. not meant to be here. And yeah. sometimes your friends hold you back. Sometimes your friends don't want you to heal or grow because they're needed when you're sick. That, that sense of people telling you that you don't belong, like looking back now, like but maybe it was, it was fate, maybe it was a higher spiritual calling. Is there anything that you would say logically that actually, yeah, I can see now why people said that? Yeah, because sometimes people can see the protection in you when you can't. And sometimes people can sense the aura, even though you're around people that have, have bad aura. And if they, if people still feel that they can talk to you and approach you to be themselves, that means they picked up something that you ain't picked up when you're around other people. And so, and sometimes your friends know that you're a good person, but they try to corrupt your character to make you like them because they're hurt as well. And yeah. the, and if you be different, it makes it will make you see their errors and they don't want you to see their errors or their fallings or their weakness. Where I, vulnerability came my strength and my strength came my weakness. Yeah, interesting. So you start trying to create a life outside of gangs. You mentioned obviously through your parents and through various connections, you didn't struggle in terms of employment um, even though you, you have a criminal record. What, what are you doing today, Anton? Um, I, I mentioned as in my intro that you're the founder of Guiding Minds. What's that all about? What's that trying to achieve? Yeah, so uh, just to pick up, every job that I've had is always leading up, led to this. So okay, the job, the job that I had before when I left school, was a, I was a sport, I used to work in the gym. 
and I used to PT people, but I used to PT uh, and uh, support young people and adults that were high risk. And so from that, I then went into a care home. I was a resident worker and I worked in uh, with high risk trauma kids that are in gangs or exploitation. And then I also worked in a, uh, a college in the gym, supporting the young ones. And then I went to a victim support uh, service in Northamptonshire. And from there, I created Guardian Young Minds. And Guardian Young Minds was created in a gym where I used to work. That's why it's called gym. And uh, I believe that there was a gap in the market because no one would want to work with gang members and they saw gang members as a threat but I saw them as me and saw them as victims of own situations that they're making other people victims and they need to, and the cycle needs to break and I saw a gap and I took it and yeah guiding your minds is a service that works with your people and adults that are involved in gang violence and or victims or perpetrators of it and we're mentors and therapists to support the trauma and violence so mentors and therapists supporting victims but also supporting gang members themselves in presumably befriending mentoring trying to encourage them out of that situation if i got that right yeah that's correct yeah, yeah. and i mean thinking about your comment um picking up on it from earlier you, that that some of the gangs today sort of their conscience sort of is not there in a way that yours was. Is that definitely to, so? You mentioned how your crew you you wouldn't set about someone's parents, someone's sister. You wouldn't go and burn their houses. I'm presuming that there were fights in the street. It was it was violent and rough out there on the streets, but between gang rival gang members only. Whereas. You wouldn't attack their families, but but apparently they do today. We hear a lot of about toxic masculinity and and, and violent youths and what what's going on? Do you think the the generation of young men in particular, yeah, and young people, but in particular men, do you think they are more violent and have less conscience than before? And if so, what's happened? Why why is that? I believe that. Uh... The young generation trend is the more you do bad is the more accepted. And the more popular you are, the more people get scared of you, the more friends you have because they the every child wants to be friends with you because you're the baddest person. And bad is come good and good is come bad. And morally, a lot of parents morally support these bad ones because they're rather their son not be a victim and be protected than be a victim and be hurt. So there's a lot of parents that support it. And, there's, and because they live in crisis, a lot of parents get help from their children doing wrong. Financially, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and this is the, the pull where parents, where you see a child go to jail, you always hear the parents say, what we're going to do now, we needed that, even though their child was at risk of dying. They still, because sometimes parents' needs comes greater than the risk of their own children. And yeah. it's hard, it's hard, because the life that we're living in now, to meet ends and to keep up with what's happening. And children these days have got pressure. The pressure is, if they don't have something, they're poor. So they put pressure on the parents, the, pressure, the parents can't afford it. And some, some, some kids love their parents where they don't want to even say to their parents, can you get this? So they get it themselves. Yeah. So is there, is there a link? So for me, the reason I hate the phrase toxic masculinity, there's a lot of reasons why I don't like that phrase. Um, but I also think that if we think of men, and, and as you rightly say, gang victims, they are victims themselves. The reasons why our young men might be in gangs, they might be violent, is... Uh, self-protection because they're living in areas of deprivation where they need to be in a gang. They may be under pressure in terms of just the cost of living crisis. As a family, we know that last year, 3 million people reached out to a food bank. 15 years ago, that 3 million number was 26,000. I mean, that is a st 
staggering increase. And so we have incredible inequality because in the same period of time, the wealth of the UK's wealthiest people has collectively has tripled in that same time. So we have very unfair system structures. Uh, for me, why are our young men toxic, if you're going to use that word? Well, you look at the impact of austerity. Uh, we've lost a billion quid's worth of funding for youth services uh, over the last 10 years, resulting in the loss of hundreds of youth centres, the loss of thousands of youth workers. So for me, the reasons why our men, our young men might be more violent and have less conscience today, those reasons are complex, in my opinion, and varied. Uh, it's harder uh, for working class children uh, leaving school to have a job unless they are well skilled up. There aren't lots of menial jobs that you can just get like that with, with no qualifications. But 60, 70 years ago, there were. Are those the things that you would agree with? Or would you say, look, Andrew, you're missing something here. The reason why there's so much violence is this. Is there another reason? No, I think I think you're correct, I, but I, I would add to it in a way where there's a lot of there's a lot of kids using a lot of drugs. There's right. a lot of mental breakdown mentally, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that have been undiagnosed in your people, and and it's not cool to have a diagnosis so that that they ain't been medicated or been even seen to to learn what they have. And also that there's a there's a trend and there's a trend on social media that the technology's increased so much where these kids have got the ability to find anything in their hands and to find where someone lives in their hands, to to create a lot of money in their hand. That is they've got so much power. And great power comes with great responsibility, as Spider-Man says. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and actually, you know, the reason why, and I do a lot of this um, exploration in my own speaking work, I, I do a lot on men's mental health. If we explore, well, why are men and boys struggling when we look at uh, the, the a variety of data that suggests that we are struggling? I do think social media is a big part of it, a big part of possibly why, the, the conscience of, of, of people has gone a bit dead. Why, why perhaps we're more morally corrupt? Partly, I think that there's comparisonitis. So never before we had everybody else's good bits shoved up our noses in the same way. So we think we absolutely, in fact, not only should we have those things, if we don't have those things, then we're not cool and we've lost streets. So we've got to have those things, but those things that we expect are actually quite expensive um and of course you as you said with social media you've got like influencer culture you've got dark voices uh, manipulating people uh, there's a lot of people that are hurting but then along come these voices and organizations that really play on that hurt and twist it and i do that you know at what point do we say enough with social media we we need to we can't get rid of it but we're going to need to really do something radical. Um, what I say to a, a lot of people is, it's not the it's not the gadget or the item that's evil or bad. It's what it's what we do with the gadget that makes it evil or bad. So it's us. And I always say to your people that if I hold a knife now. I've got the choice to do bad or good, to make the knife come bad or good. So it's me. So even with social media, social media can only come and corrupt minds if the, uh, it's pushed on a person or it continues to come out, which that means that it's not the, the platforms and the software that's created to keep showing these things to kids is part to blame. And yeah. these are big companies, big organisations. And that's that's why I always say to uh, police when they always go on about the social media stuff, there's greater powers at play. And as we know, scientifically in our minds, if you see something often and hear it constantly and there's a music to it, your, your brain automatically takes it in whether you like it or not. And this is why 
violence has increased because of drill. Drill causes as a melody. A melody brings words, words stick in your head and create you to do things without you even knowing. Having an anger from a music that someone else is put, put in music that you adapted without even knowing. And this is why I always say to your people, you got to be careful who you listen to and what you're hearing constantly. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to a speaker, uh, Sir Michael Win Wilmslow, who used to uh, head up um, Ofsted. Um, and he has, he now advises the government on how to reform. He's got some great ideas of how to reform Ofsted. I, I hope they come off. But I remember him saying at the end of his speech, you know, one of the biggest challenges with our young people, and particularly social media, is because of social media, more than ever today, we need to teach our children and young people to think critically, to critically analyse what they're looking at, to question it, to fact check it. Um, and I thought that was quite insightful. And, and you're right that it's not the tool. A knife isn't bad. A knife can cut a cake so you can share it with your neighbours. Not inherently bad in itself, but just as you rightly say, it's the tools. So maybe it's not about we need to ban it. It's more about we need to look at where these harmful platforms are and get a lot more serious with tech, um, which it, requires bold government, I suppose. Yeah, it, and it, a lot of your people think there's a lot of your people doing bad, but there's a lot of your people doing good. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes when you feel alone and you're scared to do good and you, all you see is bad around you, you feel you, you lose confidence. So you, it, it's better to call them one of them than be against them. But if they realise that there's many people in the same situation that are uh, being good with whether they whether the other side likes it or not, they will start understanding that it's not just me going for it. And then they'll yeah. start just... And then that's when it multiplies, where people want to be good. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. I think as well that the media have something to blame in that yeah. what's going to sell newspapers or sell stories is the bad news the shocking news, what they're not going to put on the front page of their headline is some young people helping each other in a really cool project. We, we don't showcase that stuff enough and we perhaps really should. Maybe that's something we can all do is get better at lifting, giving airtime to the really good stories um, of stuff that's happening. I always thought back to the, um, the all-male diving team that went to Thailand that rescued those boys from that cave uh, they were all older men who performed an extraordinary rescue at massive risk to themselves. They could have gone to jail had that been messed up, but they still went and did something truly heroic. But none of the UK media was talking about boy power, this man does, this man can. They wouldn't dare celebrate Yet we should you know that we're depriving our young men of, of 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 role models of people they can look up to, and I I think perhaps that's something our generation can do much more of is celebrating these cool stories, like celebrating the work you're doing with guiding young minds. That's a really cool outcome, give given your history. Yeah, yeah. It's as I say when I go to prisons and a lot of them when I speak to they always say, "Oh, was it hard? Was it hard?" It wasn't hard for me to get into places because I know how to conduct myself around people. But what was what was hard was when people don't trust you. And at the time when I was doing mentoring, I had to have teachers and police around me first before I spoke to the kids because obviously on my record, there's uh, violence on it. So they have to trust me first before I could see the kids and a lot of, not a lot of people character would have went through what I went through but at that time it was hard but now I see it wasn't just me going through it myself I was actually making a way for other people to come through it so now yeah. in Northamptonshire and Coventry many people that came from my background or the worst are easily go through it now and and so, Taj, you have to op you have to carry and open the door for other people, whether you like it or not, and it hurts. And then you start reaping what you sow. You see, you see the outcome, and I'm seeing good people coming through now that ain't got qualification. 
but they've got the power to have qualification on the street cred where kids will listen to them. And it's powerful. Yeah, hugely. I, I, that's why, I mean, it's so inspiring talking to you. Uh, and I realise, you know, the, the aura that you have is I can just see the impact, the credibility that you have in reaching out to people in this position and going into prisons. I mean, I, I would imagine you're a hugely impactful speaker. If you could give uh, like a two-liner message of encouragement to young guys listening to this podcast, what would you say to them? You're never in too deep to make a change. That is, love that. I absolutely love that. Sometimes when I ask, the podcast guests question, this question, I get sort of quite a long paragraph. Sometimes it's short, but that has to be one of the best, most insightful, yet highly concise, encouraging messages I've heard. You're never in too deep to get out and change. And that's a really great way to end the podcast. And the very last way to end the podcast um, how can people make contact with you? What's the best way of getting hold of you, Anton? So you can contact uh, Guardian Young Minds or www.guardianyoungminds.org or you can contact us on our Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok and YouTube at Gym Intervention. And we're, there's always someone on our social media platforms and uh, you can also call us by phone as well. And we have got a 24-hour phone line that you can see on our website when you go on it if any your personal adults in need of help we're there to help brilliant um anton it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you thank i know how busy you are as well so thank you so much for giving up your time for men on show uh, it's been a pleasure having you here thank you for having me